Welcome to the current federal tax developments for the week of April the 23rd, 2018, brought to you by Kaplan Professional Education and your State Society of CPAs. Well, we're back after taking a week off. There was this little thing called the uh, tax filing deadline that came up that some of you may have ran into. I certainly did. But we're back. We're going to take a look at what happened this week. And it's a Groundhog Day, the uh, tax pro version that Remember the old Bill Murray movie? Yes, we got to repeat the last day of tax season. So we're going to talk about that little detail. We'll also talk about the oral arguments that the Supreme Court heard on the first last day of tax season this year. We'll talk as well about the IRS that issued a notice or issued actually a press release talking about information on the blended rates that will apply to fiscal year C corporations. We'll talk about the IRS giving the new rates that will apply for valuing employer-provided aircraft trips for the first half of 2018. The IRS clarified the repeal of the special alimony trust provisions, how that works, because we have a, we're taking those out, what happens to existing ones. And we'll finally, we'll close with the AICPA asking the IRS to reconsider a bit of a curveball they threw about the 965 transition tax payments. They threw it to us on the Friday before the end of tax season. We'll talk about that position of why the AICPA is asking the IRS to uh, reconsider the guidance they gave there right before the end of tax season. But let's start out with what we all became aware of. If you were in the East Coast, it was on the early part of the evening on the last day of tax season. And if you were here with us on the western edge of the country, uh, those of us here in Arizona on Mountain Standard Time, those of you in California, Oregon, Washington on Pacific Daylight Time, in case you're not aware, those two are the same time in place. They're just different official time zones. Or those of you in Hawaii that got it much earlier, mid-afternoon, you had the whole afternoon understanding this was happening. Those of you in Alaska and Hawaii, uh, basically, we had an extended tax season. Now, one of the better articles about this that I found online was actually posted by NPR. And I've got a link on the screen uh, that we have here for our website today for the uh, for those of you watching the video version, but you can find it on the NPR website by just searching for IRS. They had a pretty good description about what, what actually happened and you know how this whole thing went down. But in any event, the IRS extended the tax season by one day because somewhere early in the morning on the last day of tax season, uh, what ended up happening was there was a hardware failure. So the IRS ended up extending, as we said, at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, they extended tax season by one day. There was a hardware failure early in the last day of tax season, early, very early in the morning, before any of us, you know, where, no matter where you were in the country, pretty much unless you were in Guam, uh, probably were working on uh, you know, weren't really doing tax returns yet, but we had a failure. The failure was a piece of hardware that basically denied all IRS systems access to the master file. As you might guess, that's not a minor thing to lose access to on the last day of tax season. It caused the IRS about an 11-hour delay to get things running because apparently uh, it takes that long to restart the IRS systems. Yet it's not just a simple matter of getting the bad hardware out, new hardware in. That apparently took place fairly quickly. But the problem is you got to bring all the systems up in order and get them all working together. And that took 11 hours. And obviously during those 11 hours, the IRS was not officially accepting electronically filed returns. For most of us, that was not a problem because the tax vendors be they Walters Kluwers, be they Thomson Reuters, be they Intuit. Most of them were going ahead and just, you know, holding returns. You could send them up to them. They would hold them and transmit them to the IRS once this, once the reboot process got finished. But the other thing that was down during that time period was the ability to pay taxes directly on the IRS's website. You could still pay via credit card, but you had to get charged a fee if you went to a third-party credit card site. But your ability to use direct pay on the IRS website was down during that time frame as well. So that caused some significant problems for anybody trying to do an electronic extension where they wanted to pay it directly that way. That caused some neat issues. Now, as I said, at about 7 p.m. Eastern time here, I'm in Phoenix, and it was just around 4 p.m. here, uh, two things happened. Number one, I got the first acceptances that we had gotten for that day 
transmitted back to us. I started getting some of those being told that returns were being accepted again. So I knew that was running. And at just about the same time, the IRS released the news release stating that, hey, another day of tax season. But it was kind of a good news, bad news thing, I guess. We had another day of tax season. The bad news, though, was last thing any of us wanted was another day of tax season. At least in our firm, everything was taken care of. We didn't have any returns really that needed to be, you know, that we had not taken care of, but on extension, gotten the filing done, everything was ready to go. In fact, I was the only person left at the office when four o'clock came. I was working on some stuff for the website. As you may notice, we posted articles now again. You know, I was starting to get some things ready for some of the coursework I'm going to be doing. So I was down here when they released it, but nobody else was. Uh, as we say, we did not all decide, we normally take the day after tax season off, we did not all decide we were coming back the following day in order to, uh, you know, be down here and put in another day's worth of work and end up filing a few returns that otherwise would have gone on extension. We kind of said, forget it, they're taken care of, we're done. But in any event, hey, it's tax season, it finally ended uh, after, not on Tuesday, but on Wednesday, but hey, we got done. Now, on Tuesday, the first last day of tax season, the U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the state of South Dakota versus Wayfair. And these oral arguments were presented as a case that deals with whether a state can force an out-of-state seller to collect sales tax for that state. The state of South Dakota passed a bill specifically stating that if you had no connection with South Dakota whatsoever, aside from the fact that you sold into the state of South Dakota, over $200,000 worth of sales or over or 250,000 worth of sales, or over 200 transactions with the state of South Dakota in a calendar year, you had to collect South Dakota sales tax. In essence, it was a pure economic nexus statute. Now I wanna emphasize that because we've had a lot of talk from people in a lot of time about economic nexus statutes. And conceptually, the idea was they're looking for a certain amount of sales. But almost all of those statutes tried to at least, you know, do some window dressing of saying that you had a physical presence of some sort that would bring you in under the Quill standard. South Dakota wants to get rid of Quill, right? In fact, their brief in this case simply said we need to kill Quill. And so the question becomes here for this case, primarily, will the court overturn Quill? Because this case, South Dakota made no, didn't make any effort to try to find physical presence. They made no effort to say you had an affiliate in the state. They made no effort to say that you were running web servers or you put cookies on machines in the state. They simply said, you have over that much sales into the state of South Dakota, you must collect the sales tax. And so the key issue becomes here, well, okay, will they overturn Quill? And then if they do, Justice Breyer put it very simply is the problem is going to be what would be the standard where a state could actually force an out-of-state out seller to collect the sales tax? The plaintiff, who was, represent, who was the state of South Dakota, represented by the Attorney General of South Dakota and the U.S. Solicitor General's office, they both argued that, in fact, a single sale into the state would enable the state to force you to collect the sales tax. In essence, that was a standard that would give the state standing. As well, they argued that states would have the right to retroactively enforce this standard. At least the Solicitor General was very clear that was the position the Solicitor General was taking. Uh, although, you know, they both said that, well, but the states don't intend to do this. The justices, at least some of them, were a little concerned with this assurance the states wouldn't do that. As the plaintiffs had pointed out, there have definitely have been people who have gotten letters from states seeking to collect sales tax uh, and, you know, based on a change in the state's idea about what should have been when people should have registered. And they were concerned that that retroactiveness would take place. But nevertheless, that was the argument. So the question becomes, what's the standard? And it's interesting, if you have a chance, I strongly suggest you listen to the oral arguments. They are available on the Supreme Court website. If you go to currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com, you take a look at our article about the oral arguments. We have a link there to the oral arguments, both the transcript and the actual oral presentation. It's an hour, 
straight up an hour. These are always an hour. It's an hour long presentation. So you can actually hear the interaction of the judges and the attorneys arguing the case. The justices uh, presented various concerns about a litigation nightmare was one concern voiced a couple of times if they reverse quill. In essence, if we reverse quill and there is no standard, they weren't taking for granted that we're going to just go with one. In fact, even uh, by the time the uh, Attorney General of South Dakota got done, he seemed to sense that saying one was not going over real well. So he kind of said, well, you know, we, we, we could use a balancing standard and determine if the state's interest in collecting the tax exceeds the uh, it exceeds the cost to third parties under their rule of complying with it. But as the uh, as a couple of the justices point out, well, that's just going to create a nightmare scenario where we're going to have, as one of the justices put it, 20,000 attorneys on one side, 20,000 attorneys on the other, you know, and 20,000 cases, all of which are going to be arguing over whether or not a certain state statute or a certain locality statute enables them to force the outside vendor to collect and pay the sales tax. And, you know, they said, and of course they were assured, well, th this will this will incentivize Congress to take advantage, you know, to solve the problem, something they haven't done in 25 plus years. But the justices said, yeah, but in the interim, it's going to be really expensive, messy, and nobody's going to know what's happening. Uh, they also said the fact that Congress hasn't acted in 25 years, that doesn't mean Congress hasn't spoken. They said a a very plausible interpretation of Congress's inaction for 25 years is Congress thinks that Quill's just fine and the state's tough luck. Uh, the states obviously don't like that answer, uh, and that's involved. The flip side of it, though, you know, justices also understood and expressed concern that, well, this is a little quirky because aren't we really giving an unfair advantage to out-of-state sellers? And generally, the idea of the Commerce Clause is were concerns that states would basically uh, enact statutes that would give an advantage to their own local, uh, you know, local vendors. In this case, the issue is the United States Supreme Court is saying that under Quill, with Quill, you're actually giving an advantage to the out-of-state sellers. If I don't set foot in South Dakota, if I operate from, let's say, a state like Montana, or Oregon, which has no sales tax, right? So I, I don't worry about any collecting sales tax from anybody. And I don't worry about collecting sales tax from South Dakota because I just go ahead and, you know, since I don't have physical presence there, I can sell. And that means I sell for less. Yes, there's a use tax. But as Justice Sotomayor said, you know, we understand the real problem is the problem is not Quill and the fact the buyer, the seller is not collecting the tax. The problem is that you have, she's talking to the Attorney General of State of South Dakota, that you really have no mechanism to get the use tax that your residents owe from your residents on the sale unless the seller takes the money from your residents. Now, on the litigation, there's also concern expressed, we've seen this in a number of states, saying, you know, you're kind of as a as a seller selling into the state, um, you can actually be whipsawed both ways. If you don't collect the tax, the states penalize you and come after you for failure to, failure to file and failure to pay over the tax. But if you collect the tax when you shouldn't, in a number of states, we've seen class action lawsuits against against basically retailers who've collected the tax when they shouldn't. So it's an interesting mess and in how it goes. By the way, there was also a discussion, not surprisingly, one in which uh, we, we saw Justice Gorsuch get involved since he was involved in the case in the Tenth Circuit that actually set, that said the Colorado rule was okay, whether the Colorado solution was more or less onerous than collecting the sales tax, which is an interesting question. Colorado does require detailed reporting of every customer you deal with. That's far more than you give in any sales tax report. But if I do that, I don't have to worry about what Colorado does and doesn't tax, and I don't have to worry about localities inside the state. So the representative of the, the attorney representing the Wayfair and the defendants in this case pointed out that as far as they were concerned, it's going to be easier to comply with a Colorado-style solution. And by the way, you can add to Colorado, uh, Washington. Georgia, we've talked about a couple of others that have Colorado style statutes. You can, you know, it's easier to comply with those statutes than to collect and pay over the sales tax. So in any event, should be interesting. Now, the decision in this case is expected this summer. 
And I think one thing that is clear, if the Supreme Court upholds Quill, I think everybody now is pretty much coming to the conclusion that that's going to send the states down the Colorado route. And remember, in Washington, there are horrendous penalties if you do not comply with their rules. We'll see how we'll see if challenges attempt to come there. But it's interesting, you know, the Washington penalties. So expect more states to go that route. If they actually do just throw out Quill and hope Congress acts, then I think the uh, the concerns expressed by the justices that we're going to see a long period of uncertainty and a lot of audits and litigation and assertions of liability, I think that's also a very real possibility. Hopefully, if that happens, Congress will recognize that problem quickly and actually will act. The bad news is this case will probably be decided this summer. Congress will be getting ready for election time and you know, getting a quick solution to this may prove to be problematic. In any event, keep your eyes on this. And if you have a chance to listen to that oral argument, I strongly suggest you listen to it. Next up, the IRS announced this week an IRS news release, IR 2018-99, issued on April the 16th, that uh, that we're going to be using a blended rate for fiscal year C corporations this year. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, if you go look at it, reads as if there's a 21% rate, and that's what it says, and that rate applies to tax years beginning in 2018. Now, you might think based on that, that if you have a November 30 fiscal year C corporation, that corporation is going to apply the old 2017 rates, right? The rates with the, the graduated rates and the much higher maximum rates on its income for November 30, 2018. And it won't start the 21% rate until December 1st of 2018. And if all we had is what was in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that'd be correct. But there's a provision in the code already in place, IRC Section 15. It provides that in a situation like this, unless Congress blocks it, there have been cases where Congress has said Section 15 doesn't apply. Ignore it. But this is not one of them. If the rate is changed by Congress in this manner, that you ignore the fact that the law said applies to years beginning after a certain date. You simply take that date and you compute a tax. So you prorate the tax based on, you know, you compute the tax for the full year under the 2017 rates, the graduated tables. You compute the tax for the full year at 21%, right? And then what you do is you take the ratio of days in the year that are before December, that are before January 1st, 2018, and days in the year after that date. And the days the year before that rate, over 365 times the tax computed using the old rate tables, that's part of your tax. The days after January 1st, the days after December 31st, 2017, in your year, you take that over 365, multiply that by the 21% tax computed. That's the rest of your tax. You add the two together. Now, the IRS is going to be, their news release made it very clear about that blended rate. And they also noted they're going to be, they have, have released, I think now it is out there, the new instructions and form to support the blended calculation. Uh, some of us, I know that uh, ProSystem FX in the release we have now had given warnings for fiscal year C corporations, because by the way, we're already in my office trying to file a couple. Uh, if you have fiscal year C corporation, They've given the notice that, you know, the IRS wasn't really ready to accept blended rates yet. Uh, hopefully this means the IRS will be ready to accept them. We'll be able to get rid of those here shortly. Uh, those of you, we are approaching the first blended year due date for traditional ones. If you didn't shut your corporation down to close out the year sometime early in January, the January 31st fiscal year corporations are going to have their returns due on May 15th. And I would suspect this means that the IRS will be able to accept those electronically filed returns uh, before May 15th. But again, if you have fiscal C corporations, remember, you're going to have a blended rate calculation this year. The IRS also, if you have an, if you have basically your company owns an aircraft and employees sometimes ride along on the aircraft, not necessarily for business, but for personal trips, the IRS has issued the ways you can use the SIFL tables that you can use for computing the value of flights on employer-owned aircraft for compensation purposes. Uh, those new rates are in effect for trips going from January 1st, 2018, all the way through the through June 30th. Again, every six months they reset. 
Now, the terminal charge will be $41.71 during that period. And uh, the mileage rate goes from 22.82 cents per mile uh, down to 16.73. Uh, the rate per mile varies on how many miles there are in the trip. So you have to go how, how far, you know, how far was the trip, how long it was, you get the new rates, right? So those amounts to be used. Again, that's in Revenue Ruling 2018-10 that was issued on April the 16th. Also, the IRS is dealing with more Tax Cuts and Jobs Act issues. This was notice 2018-37, issued on April the 12th. And this deals with the alimony trust problem. Okay, you may some of you may wonder, alimony what? An, the alimony trust is a special rule found in former now, soon to be former, Code Section 682. Code Section 682 provides rules where as part of alimony, we might have put funds in trust. The income from that trust will be payable to the surviving, to, to the spouse, to the soon to be ex-spouse, you know, for some period of time. But otherwise, this structure would, based on its ownership, it would otherwise qualify as a grant or trust to be taxed back to the spouse who put the money in, right? The one who's, quote, paying the alimony in, in this scenario. It provides if you set up such a trust, the income from that trust will be deemed income of the spouse who is the beneficiary of the trust. Even though it's a grantor trust on the grantor trust rules, we're going to ignore that and tax it to the beneficiary. It's not going to be taxable income to the grantor, you know, and then, you know, and you know, that structure where we'd have to tax it back to the one who gave up the funds, who put it in trust. The problem is, of course, since we're repealing the deduction for alimony, effective for agreements entered into after December 31st of this year, we're also repealing 682. So this goes away. Now it's an interesting question. With this gone, those things are grant or trust. So does that mean if we set one of these up two years ago, that now in 2019, it's suddenly going to not be taxed now to the former spouse, but it's going to be taxed to the one that put the money in. Well, the IRS explains that, no, no, they're going to issue regulations that will explain that old 682 will continue to apply to trusts related to pre-2019 divorces unless it is modified and you say we want to apply the new rule. If you do that and you have an alimony trust, then gang, it's going to, you know, it looks like it's going to splash back on to the person that funded it. So you want to take care of that at the same time. Now, this raises a question because these sorts of trusts may still be used for various purposes. So the IRS is asking for guidance on how to handle the grantor trust rules in this area. For those, you know, that entered into after January 1st or on or after January 1st, 2019, how do we handle this? So the IRS is asking for guides there as well when they write regulations. How are we going to deal with that on the grant or trust side of the equation? Finally, we had a little surprise on the Friday before the end of tax season. The IRS went back in. We had previously discussed that the IRS had put up questions and answers related to the 965 repatriation tax. On April the 13th, the IRS posted modifications, additions to that, and quote-unquote clarifications to that provision. The AICPA on April the 19th wrote a letter. It's the AICPA letter, AICPA letter to the IRS on the 965 transition tax and refunds that asked the IRS to reconsider the modifications they made and told us about on April the 13th. The IRS position expressed in those April the 13th changes to the rules is that if you have, so remember the 965 transition tax, that's a tax on un, basically the amount of earnings and profits in a qualified corporation, offshore corporation, for earnings and profits that are post 87, you know, that have not previously been taxed, your share of those, you have to pay tax on that. Under the 960, and we do that, we get a special deduction if you're an individual and it's a calendar or corporation, you, you basically are going to be paying tax on just under 45% of that EMP. 
It's going to be added to your 2017 return. Should have been added to, I guess we'd say, since we're after the date. Although almost everybody doing this is on extension for obvious reasons. So you add that to your return. Now, what happens is, obviously, if you have a lot of ENP overseas, that's going to be a pretty big addition. So the law provides that, well, what we're going to do, we're going to do a with and without calculation, and the additional tax you're going to pay based on that transition, we're going to let you pay it over time. And the first installment is due is 8% of what's shown as due on is what, you know, that total tax you computed. So if we computed $100,000 of additional tax, you would pay $8,000. And the IRS said, and you need to make that payment as a separate payment. So there's a 965, a 965 payment that you had to pay in with a payment voucher, or you could do it by wire transfer, along with it's separate from the amount you sent in with the 4868 for the rest of the return. Okay, all well and good. We knew that. But on the 13th of April, the IRS said, okay, what happens if, okay, I didn't know what the number was going to be. So instead of sending in 8,000, I was thinking, oh man, I don't know how much this is. I don't want to be underpaid because if you read 965H, you begin to get worried that if there is a failure to pay penalty assessed on this year's, on this year's payment, because you didn't pay in enough, you know, in essence, we discover later your payment was, we really compute the number that should have been a higher payment that you might have to pay the whole thing. So you're like, well, I don't want to take that risk. I, I hope the IRS doesn't interpret it that way, but I, you know, I, I don't want to take any risk. So I'm going to go ahead. And even though I think eight is going to be my number, I'm going to pay 12 just so I have a lot of, you know, a lot of coverage. And the concept was, well, I do that. It turns out it's eight. I'll get my four grand back. And yeah, they won't pay me interest for a few months, but who cares? You know, it, it's easier to live with that without taking the risk of losing the whole thing. Well, the IRS came back and did two things. Number one, they said, oh, yeah, if you gave us 12 grand, you should have given us eight with your 965 payment. Uh, we're keeping the four. Because you still owe us 100 grand. You still owe us another $92,000. So we're just going to keep the four and apply it against that 92 and not change your later payments. In essence, we're going to reduce the last payment. It's apparently how we're going to work this. Well, wait a minute. So I'm going to prepay four grand, but it gets worse. Let's say you're one of those clients who gets to the end of this, you know, on oh, my returns going on extension. Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I want to want to pay and I don't want to be underpaid. I hate paying penalties. So what I'll do is I, I, I will pay in what I think I owe at the end of at April 15th. And then I'll pay in my first estimate. I'll just add the first estimate to that. So therefore, what I think my first estimate should be. So therefore, I won't have a failure to pay problem, right? In essence, I'll, I'll have way more. I'll be way overpaid. And I'm just going to apply that overpayment to next year's tax. It turns out I didn't need that much of it. Fine. We're good. I'll live with that. Well, here comes the problem. The IRS said, oh, yeah, if you're overpaid on your regular return. So let's say we have a $25,000 overpayment on a regular return. In addition to that, $4,000. We're keeping the 25 and also applying that against the 965 transition tax. So basically, any refund goes against the 965 transition tax until you get it fully paid off. So basically, we're keeping all the money. Well, the AIFCPA wrote a letter this week objecting to the last minute change in the rules. The AICPA argues, and you can read about it in the article that we have on the website, you can download it in the PDF we have as well. That, that this is contrary to Congress's intent, and that really what we would what you should do is allow taxpayers to designate any overpayment to say, okay, apply that to my 965 remaining balance, apply it to next year's taxes, or refund it. But don't simply grab the money. Now the key question that it was asked by somebody is will the will the IRS pay attention to this? My take is if they get other complaints. If they get a lot of complaints from other organizations and taxpayers about this position, then they might reconsider it. Otherwise, we're kind of stuck. Certainly, it made it very difficult there because I had to talk to clients, you know, and explain that we're going to pay this in. And yeah, you know, we think it's higher than it needs to be, but we don't want to risk being underpaid. But if it's higher needs to be, whatever, whatever we're over, they're just going to keep. 
And by the way, and if you're overpaying your regular tax, uh, even though we didn't know this is going to be a problem last year, uh, that overpayment, that overpayment you always have, that refund you always get, you're not getting it. It's going to go against this tax as well. So we'll see if anything moves on that. Hey, tax season is over. So now it's time to go look for your courses at your state society. Uh, as I wanted to remind you, I've got sessions coming up. Uh, I'm going to be presenting for the state of New Mexico and the state of Arizona at the end of May, a session on the qualified business income and other changes to the other changes in tax cuts and jobs act that affect businesses. You know, we've gotten through all the mess. Now of the individual returns, we're getting through that. We're going to talk in this course about what exactly is going on because qualified business income is a problem. So, Check the New Mexico Society's website. Check the Arizona Society's website. We're going to have courses on this topic in both locations, both in Albuquerque and Phoenix. Uh, and by the way, the course in Arizona is going to be webcast because Arizona webcasts out of their facility. So if you're in Yuma, you do not have to come to Phoenix in order to, uh, in order to participate in the webcast. So, you know, in order to participate and be part of the group. So we're going to be doing those courses and your state societies have a ton of other courses. I've got courses coming up over the summer in, in New Jersey on a number of topics. I'll be in other locations. Got a few more in Arizona. Got one coming up in Arizona early on in the season on multi-state taxation. Hey, Quill, we'll see how we discuss about that. All of this could be fun. Check your state society catalog. So we've got tons of useful courses, both ones that we're doing here at Kaplan Professional Education and the ones being presented by other individuals who are presenting for your state societies. This has been Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of April 23rd, 2018. You can catch our updates during the week as things happen at the website currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. We'll post their information as we become aware of it. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to me, Ed Zollers at currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I usually post there when we post on the website. I'll also, from time to time, if I discover something, I'll post that on the feed like I did as soon as the IRS came out with, hey, tax season just got extended by a day. I did post that, for better or worse. You can also follow me. Uh, I do post some information, have some discussions on the subreddit, uh, reddit.com slash r slash tax pros. Those of you in Arizona, I participate in the Arizona Society's listserv. I also, every so often, will drop into California's uh, tax talk discussion group if you're on there. But in any event, it's been a fun week. Uh, cer certainly been a hectic one, as we are all kind of expect this time of year. Hopefully you're relaxing, getting ready, and we'll see you hopefully here next week as Kaplan Professional Education or State Society brings you another week of current federal tax developments. <music>